Hello, everyone. I think we are almost uh, have everyone in. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome you back to session three, uh, which deals with textiles as a biofabrication strategy. Um, and it's, yeah, the second session today of this wonderful day two. And we start with a Zoom presentation, actually. So we welcome Christine Yuliana. Um, Christine is an assistant professor in architecture and sustainable design at the NCUTD, which is the Singapore University of Technology and Design. And um, she is like she teaches and coordinates an interdisciplinary design and architecture design course. And she co directs also the Dynamic Assembly Lab, which is an award winning design and research lab that expands architectural design capacities through biomaterial fabrication, computational fluid dynamics, simulation, and interactive assemblies. And the first time I actually met Christine was after, like, email, sorry, online, <laughs> was after an Acadia um, presentation where she also um, showed her work about um, mycelium and textiles, and we were just like so intrigued by that we said we need to speak to this person. So we're even more delighted having you back, Christine, and I can see the follow-up on this work. So I would say the screen is yours. And right, thank you. Please go ahead. Uh, Thank you. Uh, just checking in that we can hear. Uh, yeah, and see perfectly. Fantastic. Um, good morning. My name is Christine. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so I, I think this room is quite uh, mature in, in this particular type of materials, but I, I have a, a script, so bear with me. Um, a cinema composite has been named a promising biomaterial uh, that presents environmental and sustainable possibilities by capitalizing the existing agricultural industrial waste as the gro base growth material. Um, mycelium composite is the mix of ma substrate materials and a mycelium root network that binds particle substrates into a co cohesive mass. In this project, we propose to gain some control over the biofabrication of mycelium composite through the addition of a 3D knitting uh, sacrificial mold. The hope is to be able to define a strategy or control uh, to control functioning po functional possibilities of this new material with fabrication processes that is accessible to designers and architects. Our team is mainly architecturally trained designers with background in digital design and fabrication. So we obviously need to talk to a wide range of other professionals and technicians with expertise that we don't have. What really helped us is to consolidate our conversations to produce this workflow that outlined the three phases of design to production for this new type of material. So mycelium refers to the root network of the mushroom. The process of mycelium cultivation stops right before the fruiting bodies because once the mushroom appears, the rate of mycelium um, growth decreases exponentially. Then the hyper refers to the root filament in the network. And the resultant mechanical properties of the mycelium composite depends on a wide range of factors, including the type of fungal strain, composition of substrate, conditions of light, temperature, humidity during cultivation, and, and post-process treatments of the material. So in the review of research on factors contributing to the composite uh, mechanical properties, uh, all of them were converged at a finding that an increase in the density of hyper network within the substrate and the thickness of fungal, fungal skin correlates directly to increased mechanical behavior of the composite. So with this review, the group identified a design potential that knit textile can be the sacrificial mold to augment and control the resultant composite, even regardless of this sort of um, you know, additional new research in, in the growth of the, the mycelium, as we've seen um, in, in, in the presentations uh, today and, and moving forward. So, so we'd like to contribute to, to, um, um, uh, to this research in two ways. Uh, first, um, uh, thinking that the external surface, um, uh, by, by adding an external surface with independent structural properties, that can be fused with and, and bound to the layer of fungal skin can contribute to the resulting composite properties. And the second, that the knitted textile is permeable and the increased access to air will increase the, high, the result, um, resultant fungal skin and hypergrowth density. 
So very early on, we made samples and, and did um, uh, the SEM images, um, this sort of micro microscopic um, uh, images of this of, of what's happening at the at the at the intersection of the knit fabric um, um, textile and the uh, and the and the hyper skin. Um, and it shows, and this image shows um, that they are this sort of intertwining of these. Um, so so um, and and we had the idea potentially that if we have yarn that has uh, a, a certain organic properties that the yarn could be um, a, a kind of highway or a kind of food source right to encourage the growth of hyper. However, we thought it's difficult to then get a meaningful understanding of hyper density at the scale of the SEM images. <laughs> so we took photographs of the composite sections, um, uh, cutting it through in the middle. Um, and through just photography, try to understand and, and make these um, black and white uh, sort of translated images from the photos. Um, then then uh, uh, we made um, multiple samples. Uh, so we knitted sort of uh, three types of, of um, uh, sacrificial mold out of cotton uh, acrylic and um, high density, um, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. Um, and of course we have one that is the control with, with no uh, fabric at all. And so we cut through all of them and tried to study um, the different uh, composition of uh, different density of growth at the these three areas. And we're pretty excited to see that cotton has the highest density of growth, right? And so we got pretty excited uh, at this point. However, it turned out that we have to have other findings to consider. Uh, so these um, five samples of each mycelium type composites uh, went through the sort of compression testing. Um, and the result shows that the uh, high molecular um, polyethylene yarn composite has the highest uh, sort of performance of, of compression in, in uh, young modulus fiber. And, um, and so, and they're followed by acrylic and the last is cotton. And so, so we were pretty disappointed, <laughs> but uh, because of, of um, uh, this sort of, uh, I, I, we didn't find that is contradictory. Um, actually, we found perhaps that uh, based on this result, we propose there is a design potential here where uh, the mold knit structure can be made up of a high strength yarn based knit to maximize the result in the composite structure. And then in the simultaneously, we, need, we could insert a nutrient rich yarn um, at the same knit surface to encourage the hypergrowth and increase the fusion of the high strength textile skin with a composite body. So that's the kind of um, conclusion we get from, from these various sort of characterization of the, the materials that we found. Um, so the, the team identified the need to articulate um, various distortions and um, that model geometry in our digital design process goes through in the dynamic nature of cultivation um, and, and processes in this kind of living um, um, material. The aim here is to control and predict that the model geometry that we, we make uh, would, can be the final geometry. Um, and, and the research is really sort of uh, trying to um, characterize these things and, and, and have an understanding. Um, so there's various sort of adjustments. And the first we, we, we like to do is to kind of look at this idea of the Fizen effect adjustments when we tension the mold um, so that it would be stiff um, to resist the, the type of pressure um, that the compression of the substrates would need uh, to gain strength as the composite. Um, so we did a various studies, a very simple sort of uh, um, 10 cm type of um, unit, right, by, by extension, extending this mold so that it's, it's um, from, from a very soft material to, to have the strength um, that could be a mold and the, the type of distortion that we need to produce in the knit um, so that the result is one that is of a uniform um, um, tube like you see in the right. So this is our little quick um, samples. Um, and we, we investigate very quickly or we land, I guess, I guess very quickly in, in this tubular geometry as um, a sample. Um, uh, based on the, the kind of projects we've done in the past, a, a type of formal typology. And um, this is work that we have done in the past, looking at um, using uh, soft um, um, sort of uh, mold to, to make um, sort of a cast of concrete. 
Um, so we, we're thinking in similar ways. This is a, a, a way that we can interface with this sort of tubular geometry with the same, with a different sort of infill. Um, uh, we looked at uh, different options of valence and connections and landed in this uh, two type of units, uh, end and mid unit. That's able to give us, uh, you know, uh, what we believe are quite a variety of design options um, as a column per se in architecture. And so, so the next sort of challenge is looking at the knit mold geometry and, and, and the knitting instructions. And, 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 and what we did um, that is accessible to us is to try to sort of simulate the distortion from the model geometry to what the sort of knit um, uh, distorted uh, form should be. Um, and, and, and then relaxing that three-dimensional geometry on a surface, just like a pair of jeans. <laughs> we joke that this, this really looks like a pair of pants. And, and, and to circumvent this sort of um, um, really complex 3D knitting sort of instructions, what we did was highlighted um, areas that rises and, and areas that sort of fall in this creases to try to understand perhaps the translation and very um, quick translation of what which areas needed to to add um, in terms of its spacing um, and and which area need to be sort of um, tucked in right um, in the in the knit instructions um, and through that we we it was a trial and error and and through through that sort of process we produce our um, two type of of knit um, and when we put them in our um, jig. Um, it, 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 it is, it is uh, quite free-flowing and, and it seems that the, the geometry is continuous. So this is just the view from the top. Um, then what happened is we fly all of these um, um, uh, knit mold with its sort of end caps um, inserted to them to Indonesia. Um, so uh, always we have this idea that um, things that, that is produced in Singapore uh, which weighs potentially a 0.5 kg per mold uh, could then be impregnated with um, agricultural waste in the neighboring countries um, where the buildings would be built, right? So this, this is a kind of narrative that we have about um, uh, contributing to, to uh, this, this idea of high tech and, and more kind of um, uh, site specific um, uh, need to, 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 to build. And um, these are uh, um, us working with a startup in Indonesia, um, and and they <laughs> humor us with uh, with uh, sort of setting up this thing and and and, and testing out sort of with a facility, um, 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 fitting growing this um, uh, the two molds right. So th this is this is our uh, prototype. Um, we had wanted to um, made the whole column, um, but it is really during the 2020, uh, 2019, 2020 period. So we managed to get two units um, and, and then the project is a one year pilot. So it, it has ended, unfortunately. Um, so, so what we um, learned from this uh, quite quickly is this, um, what, what can we sort of, how, how can we push this idea of um, of, of having uh, the, the, uh, an insert or, or being, being able to sort of functionally um, alter the, the um, strength of this mycelium composite in, in different areas. Um, so uh, quickly in, in the lab, we, we tested these possibilities of adding or inserting um, rows of inlets, uh, in, uh, in, inlays, the cotton inlays in areas that are more dense and, and less dense as an idea of perhaps um, we could do these variations uh, within a, a potential kind of column structures where we need more strength and less, right? So this is our kind of um, versions of, of predicting sort of uh, future possibilities of, of this way of working. Um, so, so that's where the kind of research ended um, and, and um, some of our students got to know about, about this and really wanted to work on it as their architectural project in, in studios and in, in research uh, in, in the kind of academic setting. Um, what we've come up constantly um, in conversations with them is the sort of strength or the, the sort of weakness of um, this particular type of material and how they contrast with other type of building materials. 
and and the reality um, of helping built with this material is also this uh, the the inconsistency right of of um, growing materials. Um, so and in the kind of lab setting that the the materials still need to to adhere to. Um, so we I have a, a group of students who are really kind of interested in a very site specific way to build right the, the idea that we could take things from the forest um, um, and having community come and build something together, um, having the sort of waste from the farm uh, be part of the um, assets uh, for, for, grow, uh, for, for materials for, for building. And we question um, um, how long or how static or how, um, how permanent uh, should certain uh, uh, building, uh, building elements be. Um, so uh, this idea of, of building uh, not with efficiency, but with a kind of redundancy. Um, so the students looked at um, if, if we have to replace um, uh, building components because of deterioration or not knowing um, how well it has sort of grown or the kind of variations of it, um, then perhaps this idea of discrete components with an ability to, to switch out uh, building components um, uh, is important. So we're looking at sort of joineries and how um, things can be replaced. So these are some of the students' work. Um, so it goes to, to the, the, the study of how do we um, assemble and disassemble um, these uh, modular units that is at the scale that uh, could be moved by an individual person. Um, so, so modularized uh, um, a, uh, architecture element um, to the size of the sort of human body. Um, and producing sort of uh, you know potential uh, new types of ways of building and occupying um, um, structures. All right, thank you. Um, this is uh, us, and I thought we'll, we'll just show um, um, if you're interested to to look at our website. And we also do other knitted uh, work um, uh, that at a larger scale, um, uh, not dealing, of course, with with uh, living uh, materials, um, but we are very interested to look at the potentials of knit um, and cultivation of, of living organism. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Christine. This was an absolutely fascinating presentation. And I think it illustrates really well um, what also discussed yesterday about the hierarchy, how important um, or how influential the, the sales are from yarn to an actual and then upscale version. Um, also, I can highly recommend for everyone who haven't checked out the website how they could actually get some interesting insight. Um, with this, I would ask are there any questions from the audience um, which came up during the talk? Mm -hmm. Shane, go ahead. Um, hi, Christine. Thank you so much for that lovely presentation. Um, it was a really quick question, actually. It was just about the testing that you've done. Um, you talked about testing the different yarns uh, with mycelium and that the, the cotton had the least compounding strength. But I wonder if you compared that to the columns without any textile and what um, the results were. Yes, so in our sort of characterization of the material tab, we had um, one without any, um, and it performed, sorry, I have to scroll all of them back. Yeah, right here. So uh, that would be K, the control, um, which performed um, um, significantly lower um, than having a kind of high strength um, yarn knit. Um, as a kind of exterior shell, right? Um, so that was very encouraging. Um, and and uh, from the study, you know, we could glean that um, a, a kind of lower strength yarn like cotton uh, versus a very high strength, um, maybe synthetic um, and so forth, um, uh, make a huge difference, right? Um, But, but you know, I, I think we came into this project with the expectation of having something to, um, knit that can affect the growth of things. And so um, we, we were slightly disappointed. In, in some way, I think the, the scale of effect is just different than what we were expecting. 
although here um, we, we do see that um, cotton does encourages more growth and I don't know why you know it might be that they, um, um, they attract water in certain ways right that other yarn sort of repels or I, 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 um, I don't have an answer to that um, and so that is why in the end we we kind of propose that we do have the, the sort of the more growth centric yarn that might be weaker are able to then help with adhering um, the higher, uh, more intense um, uh, performing um, yarn. Yeah. So they have its own sort of function in this way. Sorry, I don't know if I answered your question. I think so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. Hello, thank you for your presentation. Um, you mentioned using agricultural waste, which is you know fantastic um, materials used. I was just wondering, could you tell us a bit more about the agricultural waste and if you found particular types of work that could be very high strength mycelium? And also whether it really is waste. And did you sort of look at what that material is normally used for and that you normally sort of recycled through the farming process? So whether it's really right. Yeah, so so we we worked with uh, this group um, in Indonesia and in Bandung. Um, I'm just gonna get a photo. Yes, this this is the typical what what we saw, um, and what I um, understand is farmers, um, um, sort of mushroom growers in Indonesia, already sort of um, um, has gotten um, uh, substrates or sort of bits of. Um, uh, sort of wood chips or waste from um, the sort of uh, logging uh, industry or kind of wood industry that's um, still really active in Indonesia. Um, so, so this uh, smaller pieces of wood is left over from this sort of industrial uh, processes the farmers would take, break them down to smaller um, pieces, and then that is used um, as growth substrate. So I think this, this group uses that as a kind of base. Um, of course, they um, from my understanding through different iterations, they do add um, other sort of starches uh, to help kickstart the growth, right? So it's not ju just industrial waste, but I, I do believe the majority of the substrates are indeed um, industrial uh, waste. I think that the re they, they are looking at looking um, agric direct agricultural waste, uh, like palm oil, um, sort of sort of um, sheddings of, of, of those um, um, uh, from the plantations, but I don't know where that that goes. Um, I think for for us, we, we know that these research are ongoing, um, and 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 there's always sort of new ways to to uh, make a higher performing um, uh, composite by um, uh, dealing with a different strain of of mycelium, for example, or or understanding a, a better substrate that, that increases growth. Um, uh, whatever that is, um, uh, we want to act, augment those performance with a knitted sacrificial mold, and and that will sort of boost, you know, uh, more right um, um, our ability to control um, their their perform uh, their their characteristics. Thank you. Any more questions? Perhaps I would have one. Then um, I was quite. Um, Intrigued by the video, what, what you were showing, like when you and your colleagues were filling the, the piece, actually, and you could see in the beginning they had the shoes on and in the end, not anymore. So it seems like quite an engaging process. And I was actually wondering this setup, um, what you had there to, to keep the form. Um, what was the challenge there to keep the form? And did you have any reflections on that? Also, how we need to, to work with during the process? Yes. Um... So, so this is, I guess, where we're most comfortable with as architects. We play with sort of soft materials and, and changing it by positioning it in tension. Um, that was uh, sort of what we have done in the past. In this case, um, the, the transformation of soft to, to hard tensioned um, mold is quite um, uh, significant. Uh, we had quite a bit of failure <laughs> in creating this sort of jig that's not strong enough. Um, it's quite amazing, actually, um, how much strength or embedded sort of um, energy is there to hold up this this um, this sort of um, um, uh, tensioned mold. Um, and there's a lot of sort of constraints in the sizing of this, um, how long our hand are, because it's all in the end still a manual process. And we, we wanted it to be a manual process um, because of the, the, the type and the 
context in which we we imagine um, this would be made, right, in a kind of less developed, um, sort of uh, technologically um, less accessible kind of places. Um, so the, the 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 height of it is considered uh, for those um, sort of abilities uh, for our hand to reach. There's also the sizing of the tube. Um, where I'm just talking to the farmers and the growers as the idea that um, uh, after a certain size, um, there's just it's it's difficult for air to reach the center, um, and 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 that would have sort of weakened core essentially. Um, so all of that is sort of kept in consideration. To, to understand the size of this unit, uh, a building unit, right? Which diameter actually had this, um, had this building unit? Like the thickness? Uh, yeah, the thickness, uh, uh, they were giving us um, not more than um, nine cm in diameter. Um, yeah, so it's quite, uh, I mean, it, it's a good size, I think, for a test. It's, it's, it's really small for a kind of architectural size. <laughs> um, so, so the idea that we have to have multiples of them um, became obvious to us and that that's why we looked at these branching uh, structures um, um, so that as a, as a whole, we have a porous um, sort of more fibrous um, sort of type of um, uh, assembly. Thank you so much. Did something else come up in the audience? Otherwise, I would thank you, um, Christine, and send greetings back to Singapore. I, I bet it's like quite in the night, is it? Yes, it's uh, almost eight. <laughs> thank you, thank you for having me. Yeah, you, and I, we've been thankful that you that you joined at this time, actually. So. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. I welcome Svenja Koine. Um, she's a postdoctoral researcher at the Swedish School of Textiles and uh, the University of Boros and the Center for Information Technology and Architecture at the Royal Danish Academy in Copenhagen, also short CETA. And her project, Designing and Living with Organisms, is funded by the Swedish Research Council. I know Svenja already from Sweden, like from Boros, um, and I always find her such an inspiration actually to like to have a very different perspective how to see textiles as also an interface with nature and I know she also lives in a very experimental mobile home also to experience this closeness to nature which is very fascinating and Svenja actually also was here in Newcastle not that long ago or in August with a great team um, and they were hosting a fantastic workshop where I think we're gonna hear more about now. Thank you, Romy, for the uh, <laughs> for the nice introduction. Uh, today I will um, present the project that's exhibited uh, outside of the OM uh, on the facade. Maybe you have uh, seen it yesterday uh, while you were uh, visiting the exhibition. Um, and yeah, today. Uh, I want to tell you more about the, the process and like the whole kind of structure uh, in which um, this installation uh, came about. Uh, today I'm um, presenting the first part of uh, the insect summer camp. I will uh, tell more um, about the, um, the whole part of the, the insect summer camp as well. Um, so, um, yeah, the this whole uh, insect summer camp, which was a three week uh, journey was organized by a group of uh, four people who I also belong to. And um, yeah, part of our team uh, is Asya Ilbün, doctoral candidate at the Artificial Life Lab uh, at Uni Graz in Austria. Lauren Kilbert, uh, who is an independent artist who founded the Symbiotic Spaces uh, Collective and uh, Dylan Oelskan, who is a doctoral candidate here at the Newcastle University. Um, so um, yeah, we never met in person uh, before and planned uh, the whole summer camp uh, via uh, yeah, numerous uh, Zoom meeting, meetings. And um, yeah, we also got some funding um, for, yeah, to carry out uh, this summer camp. 
and the materials and part of the technical equipment um, used during the first part of the summer camp were funded by Connected Everything UK and HBVE Engagement Fund for Mycology for Architecture Special Interest Group. And the second part uh, was supported by the Danish Arts Foundation under the program Craft and Design Projects in Denmark and abroad. So the Insect Summer Camp was a three-week uh, exploration into multi-species design. Uh, and the first part focused on um, designing for other species. And the second part focused on actually how is it uh, to, to be with, uh, to be with one another and to also be with other species. So yeah, it was really a, um, yeah, quite, interesting to um, to explore like these very different parts um, within just three weeks. Uh, so we spent the first 10 days here in Newcastle where um, building the, the installation and then we packed up everything, uh, had like one day to transition to Denmark and then like had an eight day uh, part two um, summer camp with 35 people, uh, which were different, like from uh, the setting in the first part. Uh, <laughs> so as you can see, I could uh, hold a whole presentation about also the overall um, infrastructure of, uh, yeah, of the summer camp. And just to give you a little bit of an idea, um, yeah, we had nine participants uh, in the first part and 35 co-creators, which is also a um, huge difference. Like the second part focused on co-creation. Um, and yeah, here in Newcastle, we work mostly um, inside while we work um, very much outside uh, in Denmark. And our common goal here was to do a facade a face installation and um, yeah, we worked with a program that we um, as for organization like uh, provided while in the part two, we co-created our program together. So yeah, and then in the first part, we used um, clay 3D printing, projecting and parametric design. And in the second part, we explored and co-created meditations, perception walks, movement practices uh, and bonfire discussions. So while here um, at Newcastle University, we had very specific working hours um, and workspaces. In Denmark, uh, we lived and worked uh, together in a scout camp uh, in the forest. So that was a very different environment as well. Because here we worked in a, in a lab, in workshops, in seminar rooms. Um, and in Denmark, we worked in, in the barn, in the forest, uh, on the camp, uh, scout camp uh, terrace, um, on the meadow and in the kitchen. Um, yeah, and yeah, I think I can uh, go on. So um, yeah. As you can imagine, we had quite some preparation to do uh, for both parts, and we mostly used uh, Discord uh, for the communication with the different groups. Um, that was really very useful, and we also used uh, Miro and Google Docs uh, very much. Um, yeah, and the part one on design with um, yeah, I was called in the species exploration by biodigital manufacturing technologies. Uh, and yeah, you can see all the participants um, in the picture. Aria Lim, Colleen Ludwig, Dan Parker, Lera, Nimakil, Mamun, Nukumanu, Natalia Fioreca, who is also here in the room. Um, and Ola Skereda, Hanna Babarko, and Dan Vigi. Um, yeah, a very uh, international community, um, mostly from um, uh, Europe and UK, but we also had two or no, three people from US, one from uh, Australia. Um, so, yeah, really exciting. 
and um, designing for multi-species cohabitation and thereby supporting life um, is our main motivation. And we are exploring technologies and materials that offer different microclimates through their levels and layers of porosity and temporality. Um, the core team developed a general design strategy for part one um, that combined all our expertise. Uh, for example, the um, Lauren's uh, 3D printing expertise and then Asia's hexagonal weaving method, uh, Dylan's experience with working with mycelium and I have a background uh, in textile design. Uh, so we try to, to merge um, all of this uh, together. And prior to the workshop, uh, we also met some of the um, uh, com uh, commonly observed in, uh, insect species uh, here in, in the area, um, yeah, around uh, the university. And uh, on site, we could then identify uh, some of them in the, um, in the flower beds around the university. And uh, we also foraged uh, biomaterials uh, for insects uh, to fill the modules with um, that we designed and fabricated. Yeah, the nine participants uh, for, for part one were um, carefully selected according to their expertise in computational modeling, extrusion-based clay printing and textile logics, biodesign with mycelium, microbial lab work, uh, and uh, programming with sensors. And um, on the first day, we asked them to also like present uh, to one another uh, what their expertise um, are so that everyone uh, could actually, yeah, get to know everyone um, also like in their um, professional expertise. So not only we as Organize, yeah, organizing team um, had the overview, but also um, every, every participant. And then we had a virtual field trip uh, to a conventional and well-functioning and inhabited insect hotel by Gernot uh, Kunz in Austria. And yeah, he explained all the important parameters um, that we had to then consider in, um, in our design proposal. And sorry if I'm speaking a little fast, <laughs> but uh, I have a, um, a train to catch uh, at one o'clock, so I believe that. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, like while we were discussing, um, yeah, what it actually means to design for uh, for insects uh, and for for other species, we came up with lots of questions, uh, of course, um, and this is just a, a small number um, of them. Um, yeah, and these are open questions that uh, that we continue to discuss also in part two, and uh, we don't really have an an answer for. That that through our, yeah, we find uh, different answers and different approaches to actually tackle them. Here on site uh, with the nine participants, we formed groups and focused on um, the multiple design production and setup factors for the insect wall twin. Um, that's how we call this installation. And, um, yeah, these groups uh, concern the clay and 3D printing, modeling and simulation, growing mycelium and monitoring and sensors. And these uh, slide like represents all, yeah, all the different steps um, that we went through across the week. So yeah, we we just had nine nine days to to do all of this and. Yeah, I used Miro very extensively for the brainstorming, but also for the documentation of the process and also to inform one another uh, where we are actually in our development because we, uh, we worked in different groups and uh, also in different uh, buildings. 
Yeah, these were our first trials with the clay 3D printing and free from free form crocheting. Uh, yeah, and um, yeah, thanks also to to all the fantastic workshop leaders and all the other um, people that really uh, heavily supported us in these crazy nine days. And um, yeah, I'm showing some um, uh, pictures also, yeah, how we um, developed uh, the different modules and then how we, um, uh, yeah, we inoculated those um, clay 3D printed modules with uh, mycelium. And then we had uh, some uh, unfired clay pieces and some fired clay pieces both inoculated with mycelium to also be able uh, to recognize what kind of difference does it make um, to the growth of the mycelium. And also, yeah, of course, in terms of um, temporality, since it's an outside installation and then the unfired clay pieces uh, will degrade faster than the, the fired ones. And yeah, our method uh, to um, inoculate um, or to fill my seed the infected structure. It's so that you know the presentations are just before. Um, but yeah, it was like we had a, a huge blast. <laughs> So, uh, we, yeah, it was just uh, fantastic. And on the right, we can see, um, yeah, the pre-grown or like the uh, the textile piece um, uh, that we had uh, pre-grown in the uh, in the grow lab, and then um, yeah, had it out for the first time, and it was like still warm because of the fermentation process. Uh, so yeah, it was uh, um, really interesting to yeah also to work with a more flexible uh, material that like really invites uh, to to touch it. Some images on yeah the textile part and how we connected textiles uh, to the overall structure. Yeah, most of most of us, um, uh, yeah, tried uh, crocheting for for the first time, um, and yeah, uh, we used the tree in front of the ohm to dry all the pieces. Some more close-up images uh, about the yeah interactions between the mycelium and the different materials. And especially also, uh, yeah, the textiles. Uh, and this is, yeah, how the final installation looks like. Um, uh, I hope you have seen it uh, in front of the ohm. Um, uh, if you haven't, yeah, uh, it will be there for, for some more time. Uh, and yeah, Natalia made this really beautiful um, catalog. Uh, so I uh, integrated some of her pictures uh, uh, in the presentation. Um, yeah, and now after the summer camp, um, yeah, we are uh, monitoring uh, the installation because it's very important that we also learn from those um, installations. Um, we had some uh, sensors integrated into the structure that we sadly had to remove as we uh, experienced some problems with them. Um, but we are uh, actually working further with this uh, installation um, and will assemble and manufacture um, another iteration of the insect wall train uh, in Graz and in Welsu. And there we will um, integrate the sensor kits um, that we couldn't use. And uh, we are doing some microbiological sampling. Uh, here you can see Asia doing it. Um, and now Dylan uh, is uh, taking samples on a regular basis so that we can 
yeah map uh, and understand what yeah what kind of changes are happening over time um, in order to also yeah predict more like how is such a yeah how is this uh, structure um, yeah changing over time what kind of um, bacteria and fungi um, are present how does the mycelium um, behave does the mycelium actually have enough moisture to uh, yeah to thrive or like yeah how are the conditions um, beyond the actual lab where you can yeah determine um, the temperature and the moisture level and yeah these are some uh, photos that I made yesterday. Uh, you can see that uh, one of the bigger modules um, is disintegrating um, already. And uh, on the right image, you can also see that, uh, yeah, what, what difference, um, yeah, you can see the, the different levels of, uh, of temporality. And also um, the clay uh, is changing um, the textile quite a lot is also washed um, washed from the the textile structure um, a bit sorry I have some video integrated <clears throat> okay and uh, I mean so far we didn't spot so many uh, insects. Uh, um, but yeah, yesterday uh, I observed this uh, little wood light um, when I observed the, the textile. And uh, yeah, it's really interesting um, to really yeah, examine the structure also by hands, like beyond uh, the data that we could get from sensors or the, um, or the sensing. Uh, for me, as a textile designer, it's really fundamental, to, and that's why I'm also very happy that uh, that I'm back here, uh, so that I can really, yeah, with my hands understand like how does the textile feel? Is it dry? Is it wet? Um, yeah, is there mold or, um, yeah, is is it stiff or flexible? Um, are there like what is happening in the little pockets um, yeah um, that are data okay <laughs> I have to run very soon but these are the um, the last yeah so I was very curious about this structure because it's very hard uh, but made from very soft materials so I'm really curious what actually happened to it that it's like so hard um, and you can see that all the clay uh, washed off. So uh, yeah, but it's like still very, like as hard as it uh, would have um, have the clay integrated. Um, and you can see here that uh, our yeah community is actually still very much alive. Um, uh, we are in constant contact, and uh, one of us observed this little uh, bug. Um, on one of the photos that Dylan made. And then we had a whole discussion uh, in our WhatsApp group uh, about um, this little one. And I spotted it yesterday again. Uh, yeah, and um, yeah, I just really wanna appreciate um, yeah, this fantastic uh, yeah, gathering um, that had so much uh, yeah, like um, we gathered some uh, some feedback uh, from the participants from uh, from part one and uh, and part two and yeah these were from part one and um, yeah they represent yeah all the ambitions that that we actually have with this project like we want to have uh, fun while also making a difference. And we also want to uh, create a community um, where everyone is uh, empowered to participate and to engage and to bring in interests uh, and knowledge. Um, yeah, and like one, yeah, I think I have to swear. <laughs> so this is my last slide and it shows, um, 
yeah, that we started like with this uh, core team uh, and then like added uh, the, the part one participants to our community. Uh, then the 35 to 40 part two uh, co-creators. Um, and uh, yeah, we still have um, the Discord uh, channel running. We are um, working on a catalog at the moment um, on, yeah, on further projects. So we actually managed uh, until now to, yeah, to really uh, nurture and like build up a vibrant community. Um, and yeah, this is one of the major contributions also, like we, when we talk to one another, we don't have to argument, like what is it actually that we are doing here, uh, but we can uh, discuss on a, on a very different level and know that like we understand one another, we can support one another. Um, yeah, and that's why also this uh, symposium uh, is very important to yeah to discuss on a on a different level. So yeah, thank you. Um, I don't think I have uh, actually time for questions, uh, but you are so welcome to just write me an email or reach out to me. Also, if you are interested in the insect um, community, uh, we are open um, and. Yeah, you are very welcome to join us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, what you could do, I've seen uh, Rami and Asa in the audience. Yes, yeah, so if there are questions, you can bring them on screen. If this is on the right, Rami and I don't know if we can. Yes, I need to. Yeah, we, we yeah I'm trying to find her on there. So I think first of all, um, before I say yes, I can just say I'm so impressed. Um, what we just pulled together with this workshop, like bringing people, international people with these different backgrounds, and uniting them all with like the making process of. Um, or creating something and having this experience together is actually sounded really fascinating. Should bring them up on the screen. Are there any questions from the audience um, which are which need to be addressed very urgently? Ben has one. Thanks for the presentation. <laughs> um, I was hoping to hear about part two. I was interested in getting to see that slide about what was part one. I didn't know about, about part two, which then a big contrast with part one to sort of being with nature. I was just wondering whether after part two, that made you kind of question part one and think about you know how much we should be intervening and trying to design and make things um, for nature, or should we be just sort of leaving nature to do it to do its thing, whether we should be thinking about rewilding and just leaving spaces in our cities for um, organisms to grow rather than be trying to be so involved. That makes sense. Um, is Wanya there still, or did she leave? No, she, oh, sorry, yeah, she left already. Sorry. Okay. She, oh, okay. <laughs> so oh. I would go to you. That's all right. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, may, maybe I didn't get the overall question. There were some thoughts in the question, and I'm not sure on which to answer. To be honest. So the question is, um, what, after part two of the project, what did that make you think about part one? Did it make you think differently? Maybe you might do part one differently in the future following the experience of part two. Um, I, after having like these two parts of the summer camps, I experienced them quite complementary, to be honest. Like one of them was really about um, realizing and using technology like the one in Newcastle and the other one was rather um, like more open experience based and also um, developing more the philosophical framework or um, 
yeah, designing for and with the living. And so we really had some um, nourishing discussions and exchanges about that and experiments as well. Um, so I think like both of them have the value in their own way, I would say. Like making things also gives uh, knowledge, but also questioning things and like discussing them collectively. I also have um, something to say. Um, when you were organizing this whole thing and coming together, all of us, actually these two events were separately thought of. And coming from like different philosophies or maybe points of focus, of course, we as the core team also had maybe different kind of ideas. But what was really interesting was that we as designers, let's say, like practitioners learn from the thing itself. So not, not just the participants, because I think it makes a lot of difference, like the spatial context of what you do or for why you do or what is the overall vision. And most of us work in universities, city contexts, like urban contexts, like closed in indoors, maybe like being afraid of insects, pests, and trying to avoid them, but actually challenging us or creating a platform, um, creating a facility that could challenge designers or people who maybe on a more theoretical level deal with multi-species questions was very important. Like um, I personally work with honeybees, which are rather like highly domesticated uh, insect species. So I still see myself not, not as um, multi-species yet, but that yeah, we just um, in our internal discussions we realize like how how uh, how challenging it is to put ourselves into the situations where we need to wake up uh, into maybe 25 different species of spiders hanging coming around. But of course, in Newcastle, we um, uh, throughout this making process, like the, this critical making process, like 13 people constantly brainstorming how to make it work. It was just like an incredible rain of um, knowledge and experience. And we all um, broadened our ways of doing so I also agree with Lauren, it was very complimentary and then it was kind of new um, in a way. Um, I personally never was in such a program. Um, yeah, it was a bit holistic in a sense, if you know what I mean, with the physical embodiment also. That sounds actually really good. And I think it's really important what you say about like, start to ask these questions about the multi-species engagement as well and that you also open your mind by just um, immersing yourself with nature around you so i think it's a really interesting concept are there more questions otherwise i will certainly move on to the other um, presentation thank you so much for jumping in lauren and asia thank you all the best following you Vivian is an artist, maker and biodesigner, and he has been exploring digital tools and fabrication as well as biomaterials for more than 10 years. That's like a good decade. Uh, and yeah. in groups I'm or old, it's a new thing. <laughs> like in groups or also with um, projects on its own. And he also co-founded some fab labs also in France. So you're from Paris. Yep. Glad you're here. And he also supervised the makerspace at the ENPC and is already doing a PhD at DVIC, which is the Da Vinci, da Vinci Innovation Center in Paris. Yes. So I was actually wondering if you're already like 10 years in the field and the field still is quite new, like what got you interested? But, yeah, in fact, for just, yeah, uh, I moved out of art school and I started to work on uh, machine tools, like uh, open source 3D printer. And with uh, some chance, I joined uh, Fab Labs, who just opened. And after I co found the Fab Lab of my city where I'm born, and after I move in China, after I'm back to France, I make other Fab Labs. <laughs> so <laughs> I've made some, <laughs> so many things. Scene. It's uh, sometimes complicated to explain. <laughs> so I think, um, just picking up on the Fab Labs, I think in the conversation this morning, 
say about kind of enabling communities and public from new ways of voting. Yeah. It's why, uh, it's why I try to push on my presentation. I hope it's, it's the problem is uh, it's really short to explain that in like 10 slides. So I hope it's enough uh, understandable, but yeah, we can discuss uh, at the end about that. It's why I talk about uh, personal biofabrication because I'm really concerned about uh, distributed fabrication. I don't know if you know the concept. We can talk about that after. But uh, it's another concept, so I don't have developed this one because it's lower. Okay, so uh, uh, I'm Vivian. Um, so I present you today uh, the meaning and challenge of personal fabrication. So um, ah, where we click, just uh, okay. Okay, uh, I would like to talk to you to you on the intersection between uh, digital fabrication and growing design. Uh, more specific, specifically, I think, uh, especially to uh, Jane Kane. Um, and uh, my contribution is not too far, so we talk about that after. So um, actually, Cabernet and Colette have uh, defined uh, this uh, type of practice of growing design as a co-design with living and uh, or co-performance. So um, I'm going to talk to you about the biofabrication, but uh, in a more <laughs> philosophical point of view and um, from my uh, design practice, because I work and my knowledge is about uh, uh, making specific intersection between a digital communication and growing something, growing living form, living material. So we we can see here a school matrix who directly go in, uh, directly go with the machines and the system. So we can just uh, ask to us uh, where is uh, exactly the limit between grow and digital fabrication on the system. For me, it's not really clear, and it's why it's interesting. It's why I want to develop specifically that because I think it's not enough developed. So it's uh, I work specifically on this part and. Um, I would like to say why it's important to, to, to talk about digital fabrication in the junction.
Try it now. Try it now. You want to say try it is? No. No. No, it's okay. It's good. They can all hear. Right. So just ignore anything that comes up on the screen. Just okay. do your thing. Okay, no problem. So uh so okay, I propose that, but uh what does this machine look like? So it's the next if you no, don't work no. And so uh not here. On my screen, but not on this screen. You think here? Woo! Fun moment. Um, so, uh... Uh, because in the recording and not in the presentation. Mm. Sorry. Okay. So, actually, this is uh, what it looks like. So, it's really a really military machine, but uh, so that's what. Uh, the machine link is on the left, so it's uh, just a box. And if you know value, um, uh, value reactor, in fact, it's a sort of fermentator, so it's really the same thing. So here we're monitoring uh, the fermenting activity on, and uh, I we use uh, these rolls for put uh, the index structure on and put this uh, roll in the bio reactor. Oh. So if you click next slide on yours, I'm going to okay. Um, so the machine allows us to produce this type of design. So for a moment, it's just buckets. And uh, another part is a biocomposite. So it's a really interesting part. It's a really connected. It's not separate because it's a huge problem with the plastic ball textile and the cellulose assembling. So, um, and this biocomposite, so uh, we can see there are some really good opportunity maybe for me. My idea to grow maybe bags or maybe uh, oxidic structures because for me the same trouble is the question of structural problems. So how we can fix a local deformation or local non-deformation like anisotropic, isotropic. So it's a more uh, engineering uh, uh, world, but it's the same. So um, for me, the machine and technical part of the method will be demonstrated uh, in the upcoming publication. I'm sorry. Um, and uh, yeah, so when we have that, uh, my question, because I work on design actually, uh, it's um, so what what that mean to to produce this type of things. So um, actually, I think the interesting point is uh, this permit us to go to personal digital fabrication culture. And meets, uh, I mean, personal digital fabrication culture meets the basic biology culture. I mean, it's like uh, biologist meets biofabrication, uh, digital fabrication, and he makes only one thing. Um, so, it, this thing is personal biofabrication. Uh, it's not exactly a sort of new topic, but an important intersection, uh, which is uh, really important, I think, to develop and uh, really important to, to think actually because I think it's a really huge point where we can go. So it's uh, why we propose a, a creative framework for help people to go on this uh, direction. So just, I forgot this. There are this sentence from uh, Gilbert Simonon because I'm a huge reader of Gilbert Simonon. So the designer could be the man of machines, uh, the one who works with machines. And I add in, uh, I add in the, with the living and the non-living because actually, uh, Simon don't, don't live in the same epoch. So, uh, morphogenesis framework is a um, composite uh, of uh, four steps. We we'll use making to question the artifact statue. So, because I'm really interested by artifact, because use digital machine and make these things are kind of object. Oh, spiders, um, really huge. 
So <laughs> first, <laughs> the initiation. So yeah, she wants to uh, come to the discussion. <laughs> it's, it's good because we talk about that at the end. So the initiation means to prepare uh, the artifact with, which can be uh, called time by the leading organism. And uh, in our case, as you see before, we use the knitting structures. So in the second, uh, we, we, we talk about propagation. Uh, the object is uh, emerging. In, uh, for example, in our case, the bioreactor monitoring system supports uh, with the rotative system the bacterial growth. It's really this connection and it's really a crucial part. It's really the bioreactor part. It's where you, you can grow or don't grow anything. So uh, in the third part, you have the mitigation. So the object is shaped in the milieu. The milieu is uh, the bioreactor, in fact. And in our case, we drive the bioarchetypes, fix the shape, and some, some craftsmanship, craftsmanship can be done, like just finish the pieces if you want. So uh, the interesting point we have uh, found, uh, it's uh, these three steps are already present in other bio-designed artifacts. So I talk about uh, Jane Kane again. So you can see the first is uh, initiation. So it's, it's to shape the wooden structure with the robotic arm and metal walls by hand. The second is the bacterial cellulose merging the structure. And the third, um, the object is shaped and it holds for be dry. So, and you have a shoes. So uh, the next uh, example is that can barrier. It's uh, you make a, a shape uh, with the uh, machine tools and hands. And after you spray um, a bacterial solution in a sort of bioreactor with wheels, like you see, these uh, beautiful objects and in the middle. And uh, the calcite, because it's calcite, uh, fits the form. So the structure can be out and, and it's done. Uh, the next example is uh, Nicole Shizuki, uh, Shizuku, sorry. Um, she grow bacteria on the side and she make a pottery on, on the other side and uh, she take the bot and incubate this in a this specific bioreactor, like a liquid bioreactor. And um, she, she produces a biocalcification effects with bacteria, so it's a long story. And the pottery, the interesting point is the pottery is a self fabric That means it's glass and it's thick. So the object is already strong without use of energy. It's where, where it's really interesting. So she move out the pieces and it's done. So the, the first, uh, the last step uh, of, the, of the, the framework is the, the vision of exposition. Um, so as you know, the artifacts uh, take its place in social context and he tried to challenge his artificial and natural classical uh, uh, opposition. But for me, one, one, uh, only one thing uh, not seem to be discussed in the most of this project is the question of art art interface. It's uh, interface as the design activity itself. Uh, I mean, when we create uh, this specific place of artificialization of the milieu, is not a new activity eh, for human, but it's enough a central question in, in the design. So it's why we propose to, 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 to change uh, that. So, um, yep. So what does the firm bring? Um, it permits to classify this type of work and maybe help us to think about uh, the meaning of these activities. Um, and Fully uh, help, he can maybe uh, could um, could help designer uh, to to make artifact with bio design more easily because it's a sort of classical strategy. We see we if you repeat this sort of strategy, you can have sort of same things with different uh, um, type of bacteria or whatever. I have you, in fact, I have made the same with uh, mycelium already. That works too. So, um, what type of what, what are the challenges for biofabrication? Because actually we are here. So uh, I moved too fast. Uh, we have identified three main challenges for 
biofabricate design? Uh, it's, uh, so the first is the classical question to uh, opposition between organism and artifacts. So Tim Ingold uh, proposed in uh, making and growing resident everything book uh, to consider uh, the position with matter of the artist and scientist. So the first artist know what the matter can do and the scientist is know what the matter is. So I think the position is maybe between, but it's really interesting point. Uh, no problem. I have so many times. Um, so <laughs> second, the second point is about uh, ethics. It's, um, it's um, about uh, the, the works of you three on cosmotechnics. It's really, really important books on philosophy, I think. And uh, Yuki helped us to think uh, our relation on the technical culture with the sort of comparison uh, of philosophy of techniques in old China and Greeks and uh, modern uh, and Western philosophy. Um, so it's really interesting if I, I put this image. It's, uh, the first is the image of the uh, Encyclopedia of uh, D'Alembert, and, and the other is. Uh, the book of uh, Chinese uh, techniques uh, right around the 1635, something like that. So maybe three or four cycle, cycle before us. So, but the really interesting point is the uh, graphical and how they interpret the techniques in uh, relation to the life. Because in fact, uh, in Occident, we are really interested by really technical objects, really details. And it's really clear, really details on the machine. But you see the end is like cut. Okay, I hope nobody do that for real, but okay, we are good. Okay. And here we have a sort of human, beast, and the machine is the same area with the land. So you have a sort of cosmogony, we talk about that. We have a cosmogony and it's really a different point of view on techniques. So uh, Yukri help us to think about a technology of coexistence. So it's a sort of new ethic of care. So. Um, and the last uh, is uh, Wa Watari. He worked on the non-human center design. So it's very interesting. The question is how we can design for the others, like living, non-living. So that means outside of our uh, outside of our own perception. It's really important point because actually we try on the, we we use techniques but only applicate our perception on the reality and transform the reality what we want. So we have maybe to, to deal about how the rest of the world and living things have a, a perception of the reality. So for me, um, there are really interesting points when we think about this free strategy and free challenge for biofabrication. It's all this work uh, questioned us on the relationship like really specific relationship and how we can build a new relationship. So is relationship and design the future of bio design and bio fabrication? Uh, I think I let you on this session. And uh, so it's uh, it was a pleasure to present my work to you. So. Thank you so much, Ruben. That was a really great presentation. Okay, we just skip my introduction. You can ask me afterwards when. <laughs> I want to start actually with proposing some questions and actually what could a biological architecture look like and how could growth replace construction and what could be the role of textiles within this? So today I want to talk actually about our exciting interdisciplinary research project at the HBBE, the Bionet Prototype, and who joined us yesterday to the OM already, um, did perhaps see it, <laughs> the drink reception, if you, play, if you paid attention, um, because that's the place where it grew. And to introduce you to our vision and approach of using textiles as a biofabrication method, I want to talk more about the biofabrication process today, actually and also how knitting can be used as a scaffold and shaping agent for a freestanding architectural construction composed of mycelium, bacterial cellulose, wool, and linen. 
So these ideas I'm going to present today, I want to highlight that in the beginning, is actually from a full team of seven people. So you can see everyone who's been part of it, and we developed it for quite a long time. So I want to introduce you to the fabrication process today. Um, what we all brought together, our different expertise from backgrounds in architecture, mycelium specialists, and also textiles. And before I jump into the fabrication process, I just really want to give quickly an overview about like state of the art projects and also state our own motivation of the prototype. So for everyone not familiar with mycelium, um, just super quickly, um, it's a root system of fungi and it has amazing range of um, properties and abilities. So looking for more sustainable alternatives to traditional building materials, um, mycelium really seems to provide a low impact, lo local adaptive living material for large scale bulk applications. So it has a clear potential for architectural applications as a binder to create this bulk composite materials, such as bricks, or for example, it's used as panels to provide specific functions such as acoustic or thermal insulation. And most projects at the moment are really dealing with um, bulk materials and bricks. And what we were really interested in is also pushing this with digital fabrication. There's a little bit of research on 3D fabrication, for example, to pushing it more and more towards a tuned material. So we wanted to implement textile strategies to push this more tuned material application. And that's where we really see textiles coming in as a great scaffold to scale up and also grow this in one piece rather than having bricks adding on top of each other. So why textiles? I guess it's the right audience to ask here. Um, but who heard Jane's uh, talk yesterday actually, um, heard already about how important scale is for us and how um, textiles really manage to, to bridge all the scales from the yarn impact to the scale. So on the uh, right hand side, you can also see this um, nice sharpest design parameters Jane did to map these out. And um, we have a Shimaseki knitting machine in our workshop, and we really see the potential of using this um, also to create a scaffold for growth in a very bespoke form, using this for scalability and bespoke functionality, and textiles also could be used as a nutrient delivery system. So... Um, our strategy for this, or basically the re main research aims, was using knit as a scaffold supporting structure, knit as a scaffold for multiple biomaterial components. Um, so we wanted to work with both mycelium and bacterial cellulose, but also use the geometry to reduce the necess necessary um, materials, so generating tuned material and grow it in situ to compensate for like a lack of sterile conditions to scale it up. And how these textile principles um, were applied uh, in the biodesign context was using knitting fabric as the interface for the in situ growth of a self supporting multi biomaterial architecture structure. So, the central methodology, um, what we show here, is actually divided into um, material structure and assembly. We did some preliminary tests. And then the middle part really combines digital modeling, but also the physical modeling informing each other. Um, which then results in the assembly, which actually brings all of these parameters um, together in an iterative process also, of course. So I want to start with the physical um, preliminary experiments um, just very quickly, um, where we actually tested small scale experiments first, where we investigated the effects of yarn type and stitch density on mycelium growth. And these comprised small tubes, wool and linen, um, two stitch densities around 50 centimeter high um, and inoculated with traditional mycelium filling methods, um, which were led by Dylan. And the results showed higher mycelium coverage on wool samples in comparison to linen, and also that the lower stitch density led to better mycelium growth in both yarns, probably due to airflow. And also the growth was well integrated on the outside. However, less growth was observed on the inside, probably due to lack of oxygen, like the bigger you also go. So then we tried actually to scale that up in bigger tubes, but a challenge we really faced and identify, identified was that the hand packing of the textile tubes was 
not just causing an uneven material distribution, it also led to uneven growth and distortion of the tubes, which then also was um, collapsing under loads, um, which also um, ended actually, or like increased the risk for contamination, if you like, hand pack it a lot of times and you need to stuff it in. So it was quite a um, laborious work, um, therefore that it was not evenly un, um, distributed. So based on these challenges, we needed to find a way to achieve even growth um, for structural integrity and as well as enhancing the fabrication process a bit better. So we came up with um, developing a paste mycelium material, um, which is based on a 3D printing mycelium recipe by Elisa Elsacker, and it's adjusted to our workability really in soft textile molds. So we were using a gun for injection as an injection tool to fill the soft molds and the filling was much um, easier and even. Like we incorporated small filling holes to then like start from different positions, which also helped to not um, need to like go through the, the length of the fabric. And it has the huge advantage that um, the mold actually could be created in a much more complex way. So you can see the diameter is already much smaller from the tubes what you like could not put your hand or another filling device in. So we could really increase this co um, complexity within the system um, of the knit. And as you can see here, um, we laid it down flat and afterwards we were hanging it in shape um, to let it grow in shape already. This was a very small mock-up prototype, um, what we did. And just to show um, this very quickly, so that's basically the, the process we're going through. We're knitting on 3D knitting machine in a complex form and autoclaving it. Parallel, we're preparing the substrate, um, adding the paste ingredients and water to create it as a micro mortar, micro paste, and then injecting it. Um, afterwards is um, put in the growth chamber with the growth conditions and afterwards air dried to solidify the process. This is just to get a quick idea how the process works. However, the video is not playing, I think. Ah, here we go. That was just a quick shot from our lab, how, how it looks like to, to fill this up. But also parallel to this, we were testing attachment methods from knit mycelium and bacterial cellulose. Well, I don't um, want to go too much into detail into it because actually there's also a paper published by Aileen Hönalo and um, Dylan in the Fungal Architecture on Biomimetics Journal Special Issues. So if anyone is more interested in that, please have a look at it. Um, however, what we just found out for our Bionet prototype was going with the last test which actually is growing separately the bacterial cellulose and the mycelium and use the attachment of the mycelium while it's drying because it's attaching to the fabric surface and very in the beginning we were actually also thinking already about our digital strategy to really develop this parallel and we did computational form finding and asking these questions what are we actually? Are we a parasite? Are we a tree? Are we a climbing plant? And in which um, design, uh, how, how we want to take the space. So as previously shown um, in, the, in the diagram, this really was developed um, parallel with 3D modeling from our great colleague Armand. What was really um, important with the digital strategy as well was um, when we move from designing into the simulation of the behavior of the structure. So we were learning, um, afraid about like having the tension about the weight, like how will the textile perform and the simulation helped with this, but also what was crucial um, to identify the modul modularization. So for the niche programming, what we changed our schema, we really needed to um, translate our design within the modules because the schema is also limited a little bit in width to um, translate the design into this, um, yeah, just into the knit programming. So here you can actually see the, the knit programming, the one module, and also then how we attach the seven individual, individual modules together which we then also um, 
brought everything in the home <laughs> because we wanted to have it grow on site. Um, and then we started then actually started the process of filling it up. Um, you can see lying flat on the floor um, and already us um, starting to build the, the growth chamber. So here, these were the, the simulations and now I want to give also insight into the process. Um, so the maximum hanging weight actually in a saturated form was approximately like 200 kilograms or like 28 kilograms per module which also, as you can see on the left side, led to a lot of people needed to actually lift it up in our self-built growing chamber to get the form we wanted. And the dry weight was around 70 kilograms, so you can see how much moisture evaporated as well. This gives you a brief overview. Um, how it looked like when we all were creating the growth chamber around it. So after lifting it in position, we used um, the same wooden construct or scaffold where it was hanging as well to transform it into the growth chamber to make sure to give all these uh, conditions my ceiling needs to grow. So we were placing a humidifier inside to keep humidity high, we're covering it up um, that it's also dark for the mycelium to grow and let it sit there for around two and a half to three weeks. <laughs> Then you can see um, it was already nicely grown. So everything white now is actually my, the mycelium coming through. And when it was ready, we could, we could uncover and let it solidify by just opening the growth chamber, which means it started the air drying process and the fire solidified. Then there was the big moment for us to actually, how do we get it out there? <laughs> and we needed to, to flip it. Um, which was a very exciting moment for us because we've been also afraid that it might collapse or break. Um, and in the end, we had a lot of people holding on side, flip it over and it all worked out because it was really, really stable. And that's how it's now um, flipped in the ohm. So you will probably also see it when you, when you come later to, to the exhibition. Um, and can experience it and also touch and feel it yourself. But we really, um, what I just want to conclude on is like some reflections and findings, but there were so many, so I just focus on, on some um, regarding all this process and this prototype. So regards to scale, actually, um, it was really helpful to have this um, new technique um, of filling instead of the hand packing because we could really go more into complexity in the, fo in the, in the shape. And also it improved the internal stability when you have like more complexity and can go in more geometric shapes. So there's actually a lot of potential. Also um, that the, as we discussed yesterday about when we need to get these biotechnologies out of the lab for scale up, so regarding contamination, this was actually a really good experience for us to see as a proof of concept how it could work in scale with growing on site in one piece without getting too many contaminations. Like we developed a quite stable system to minimize all contaminations in between. And also regarding the textile, digital and physical strategy in biofabrication, as I mentioned, it formed like the complexity, but it also showed that like the growth could be really uniform in one big piece. And that this 3D um, knitting with the programming, the more complex form you already managed to implement within the scaffold really eases up the process afterwards. So when the, the text already had the shape together, we could just lift it up and could make use of gravity to basically shape in itself. Um, so it's really helpful to be able to implement all of this already during the process with the programming. Regarding surface and material expression, we have more materials in, but also the inter like integrating different fibers and fabric structures, um, like we tested a lot of things. However, we also think that there is still something more to explore regarding different like tactility, which also is some. Um, 
comes um, to, to findings, perhaps in a follow up prototype, what I can announce that we're actually happy to um, start a follow up for BioNet 2 prototype, where Shane and Ben are leading on. So I would end with stay tuned and visit us all in VO to see BioNet in real life and acknowledgements, just really saying thank you to the full team um, for yeah, bringing it together. Then I guess I can also close the session. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot that. Um, so, does anyone have um, any questions? Hello, Romy. So it was amazing for our presentation to see the real architecture prototype finally in bio integrated scenario. Uh, uh, I was very curious to know whether have you guys stepped on the material radiation to distribute the load patterns of the overall capillary vault? Uh, looking at the uh, looking at the patterns involving the overall structural morphology, were there any play of uh, varying the media for colonization of mycelium so that the breakdown becomes simpler? And the load becomes uh, lighter in the top and heavier in the bottom. Was there any certain experimentation done? So you mean like implementing really within the scaffold to distribute the material loads? Not directly, like we were actually like we were thinking about it, but then there are also just limitations what you actually can squeeze in in the prototype. Um, well, there were a couple of things. Actually. Yeah. Mine's working. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking about the. The um, decision not to have that apex point um. would be one thing. So we decided to have these panels that didn't have a central apex, so we didn't get this mm. bulk of um, material in the middle. And then also just the changing the dimension of the tube all the way through. So actually, the kind of structural components were narrower at the top. Of the work, so they would be nice. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So we we did definitely consider it in the like when we did the simulation of the design and exploration. Um, but we did not implement something like more nutrition or so something like that, as you mentioned, but in the shape of the knitting, it was definitely integrated. Yes, yeah. uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I have already uh, tried the same thing, so I made some beam with me here. But the thing is, you, you use the sterilization, it's really more complicated than pasteurization. Just, I don't find. Your system is really complicated. I mean, if you use pasteurization, I think it can be really more easiest to make the same. Because after you have to pasteurize all the building for for the same. So, so. You mean like for me, for keeping it sterilized? Yeah, because sterilization is the one strategy with mycelium for, for growth. But uh, the problem with sterilization is uh, you kill all the protein too. So sometimes it's 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 and, and it's more complicated to do. So sometimes it's more easier to just make pasteurization, but you just use what hot, hot water is is wrong. So. And you know we deal with that now is actually because we brought it out of the lab. Um, we like we let the mycelium pre grow a little bit, so that is also more du like durable and already not that. Um, in, like not contaminate that quickly so that you have like this sweet spot that it already grew and um, but then bringing it out of the lab in a non-sterile environment um, and then it was quite stable so we just autoclaved all of the individual parts before but on the side in the old we tried to work sterile however it's not really possible i mean you see the yes the like a building and that worked quite well perhaps i'm not um yeah, it, 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 it's because yeah. you sterilize, but at the end, you can't sterilize because you need to use knitting out of sterilization, yeah. like a laboratory. So that's mean this certainly sterilization is not used, it could be just used pasteurization. I think we, yeah, we tried to just keep all the, like, the, the danger as low as possible, um, because as you say, we don't have really 
um, power afterwards as we take it out because then it's like in a normal room. Uh, yeah, thank you. We we have a microphone sit there. Thanks very much. Uh, do you imagine we'll always use gravity with the forms that we use? That's a great question <laughs> because um, now actually we tried different variations. So the bounded prototype worked with gravity. Um, however, we had the follow-up prototype with the same method, which is like a mycelium chair, which is also um, in the own, if you want to have a look today, and there we used molding it over something to just also get a comparison with another biofabrication method, basically having the same technique, but having another molding or shaping mechanism. Um, this really highlighted also that the textile in itself could get different properties, like it looks a little bit more um, soft because you know, like the soft state of the textile is more solidified. So you could get a different expression out of a different molding technique. Um, and then with binary two, there might be even some more explorations. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, I think it's interesting to play around with these things because all these parameters really could be like shaping the end result. So for for version two, have you thought about how the process of making it, but also the object itself could be more integrated with the own? I had the own. That's all right. So well, so buying it too won't be in the own. So that's kind of the first thing, and we have thought quite a bit about that. Um, it works in the specs that we want, um, and just. Just on this kind of follow-up project, what's really interesting is that the questions coming from the audience are essentially the things we've also been looking at and thinking about. And so I think um, in making the prototype and having to make decisions on you know how we were going to do things and the protocols that we wanted to develop, um, reflecting back on those decisions has kind of led us to really question the, you know, the, the issues that are being raised here now. So it's quite interesting, but yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the, the side of the space is well, it's, 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 yeah perhaps you can also mention that actually with bionet we were thinking in the very beginning to actually hang it in the home as well and really use like the building already as scaffolding itself it was just a bit challenging um to attach it because attachment points were missing during the end we um, went for building a frame which the smarting was transformed into the growth chamber as well. But yeah, we thought about that. I've got one question from the online audience, which I'll read out. Okay. I was wondering if the structure can be placed outdoors and how the hardened paste and the textile and BC react to moisture. Yeah, we were wondering this as well. <laughs> I actually would be really intrigued because at the moment it's just normally you would bake um, or kill the mycelium when you just like um, bake it. Um, we could not do this because the structure is just too big, so we can't put it in an oven. So in the end, you also could revive it actually because it's air dried, so it's dormant at the moment, but with moisture, it might come back, which is a really interesting point as well. So we would be quite intrigued to see how it would just continue perhaps. Perhaps you should <laughs> place it outside. So we took some samples to look at microbiome development on Bionet as well. So we just have the sequence data back for those. So it's another one watch this phase for what's been developing on Bionet, both in terms of bacteria and body. That's exciting. <laughs> yeah, which is really interesting to see. Brilliant. If there are no more questions, I think we should um, thank Romy again for the fabulous presentation and actually thank all of the speakers this morning because um, it's been a really, really interesting session.